Welcome back to Harbaugh. Late today, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul introduced a declaration of war against ISIS because he says President Obama didn't have or doesn't have the authority to, do, to wage war by himself. The president disagrees. And late today, I spoke with Senator Paul about war and U.S. foreign policy. But I began with the news that a grand jury up in Staten Island had decided not to indict a New York City police officer in the chokehold death of Eric Garner. Here he is. Joining me now is Kentucky Senator Rand Paul. Senator, you've made a real effort to reach across the aisle in terms of minority support. How do we bridge the gap between white and black at this time when these kind of situations like just broke in New York with the Garner case? How do we do it? How do we pass it? Well, you know, I think it's hard not to watch that video of uh, him saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and not be horrified by it. But I think there's something bigger than just the individual circumstances. Obviously, the individual circumstances are important, but I think it's also important to know that some politician put a tax of $5.85 on a pack of cigarettes. So they've driven cigarettes underground by making them so expensive. But then some politician also had to direct the police to say, hey, we want you arresting people for selling a loose cigarette. And for someone to die over, you know, breaking that law, there really is no excuse for it. But I do blame the politicians. We put our police in a difficult situation with bad laws. Let me ask you about the large question of our life, which is peace and war. We've had a policy, it seems, for a long time now of going into countries in the Middle East, whether it's Saddam Hussein, we've had two wars with Iraq, we had something to do with bringing down Mubarak, something to do with bringing down Gaddafi, something to do even now with bringing down Bashar Assad. Where are you on all that, and how are you different than the people on the left and people like me who think that's all been a mistake? Well, I, we might have some area of agreement here. I think one of the true things that you can say about the Middle East is every time we've toppled a secular dictator, chaos has ensued, and really radical Islam has risen, and we are more at danger. America has more danger from these regions after we've toppled secular dictators. And that includes Republican wars, such as the Iraq War, but it also includes Hillary's war in Libya. So really, I think we need to think before we act. And the other thing we need to do is we need to obey the Constitution, which says you don't go to war without the authority of Congress. You know, the people who are most stridently in support of Israel, and I understand their goal, but I'm talking about people on the very hard, hawkish right. They're always for these wars. And my question to them is, haven't you followed the creation of the Jewish community, the Jewish homeland, and the Jewish state of Israel? It's been founded on cutting deals with the governments around you. It's never been reaching agreement with the street. Why did they ever think this freedom agenda over there, this uh, overtopping all these governments, was ever going to make Israel more secure? What were they thinking? I think uh, the point is they weren't really thinking about this, and the unintended consequences have always been somewhat the same here. And I told them a year ago when they wanted to bomb Syria, I said, the unintended consequences of this is that we will be back a year later, maybe fighting against our own weapons. I said, if you supply weapons to those Syrian rebels, that we may well be back there having to fight against our own weapons. And it's absolutely true now. We will, if we have to go back in there, we will be fighting against our own weapons. Back in the 60s, when I was on college campus, I was at Holy Cross, Wayne Morris came by to give a speech at Clark University. And Wayne Morris, the liberal senator, back then, we got to have declarations of war, like in Vietnam. We have, we can't, you got to go back to the Constitution. If we're going to war, we have to declare it. Is that what you're trying to do with ISIS? Is that the principle you're fighting for? Yeah, this was a big debate for our founding fathers and has been a, it, it's really probably the most important responsibility that any legislator shall ever have, and that's to send a young man or woman into harm's way. And our founding fathers were very clear on this. James Madison wrote that the executive branch is the branch most prone to war. Therefore, we have, with studied care, vested the power of war in the legislature. George Washington was adamant about this. Jefferson was adamant about this. This is not a function that the president can unilaterally weigh in on. President Obama, when he ran for office in 2007, said exactly that. No president should unilaterally go to war. And this is very disappointing, I think, even for some of his supporters, that he seems to abandon what excited people about him. On another point, you don't seem to fit into it. Well, let me get into the idea. Is it more conservative to be restrained about getting involved in foreign wars, or is it more conservative to be hawkish? I mean, I think there's an issue of brand here in your party. <laughs> 
I think it depends on how you define conservative. Wars are very expensive, but most conservatives think that the primary function, myself included, think that the primary function of the federal government is to defend the country because it's something that the collective has to do. It can't be done individually or by corporations. So the federal government does have a role in defending the country. It's a very important role. But I think also defense is different than offense. And so the people who want to be involved in wars all across the globe and, you know, some of the people who wanted to be involved in Libya this time, a year before, the exact same people in Washington wanted to support Gaddafi. They were there. Remember WikiLeaks released a document saying that three senators were over there and they wanted to give weapons to Gaddafi. Then a year later, they wanted to give weapons to the rebels. So they've been on both sides of all these wars and I think really have not fully thought through the unintended consequences of always being involved everywhere. Of course, Hillary Clinton is the person you're talking about there on the Democratic side, and John Kerry and a lot of others, Joe Biden, all supported the war in Iraq. And my question, I'm going to run through all of them. Did the United States have a vital interest in going to war with Iraq the first time? Did we have a vital interest the second time? Did we have a vital interest in toppling, helping to topple Egypt's government of Mubarak, the military government? Did we have a vital interest in, in going to war against Libya? Do we have a vital interest today in going against Gaddafi, I mean, against uh, Bashar Assad? Where does this expansion notion that every time somebody do, we don't like a little bit or Israel doesn't like a little bit we got to go to war with them where's that come from and it's in your party more than the Democratic Party although it's in both that mentality uh, not not that we're pointing fingers Chris but uh, okay but no. is it true what I said no, is your well, party more yeah, hawkish no. than the Democrats is well, it no, here I think what is true is that you look at each one of these situations the first check and balance is that you don't let a president do it unilaterally it has to be debated and discussed You're in Congress right. that's your first check and balance then you have to discuss the facts and I think in almost every instance that you mentioned, Saddam Hussein, there's less stability with Hussein gone. Hussein yeah. was actually a check and balance against Iran, yeah. and there was some stability by pitting one against another or letting them check and balance each other. Gaddafi being gone, it's more dangerous there. An ambassador was assassinated. The embassy has fled into Tunisia. In Egypt, I think we were worse off for a while and still, in many ways, are not a lot better than we were before. Syria. I tell people this over and over again. I can't find anybody to dispute this on a factual ground. Had we bombed Assad a year ago, ISIS would be in Damascus, and ISIS would be 10 times stronger than they are now had we bombed Assad. Doesn't make Assad a great guy, but Assad is somewhat a counterbalance yeah. against ISIS. I'm remarkably in agreement with you, Senator, so much. That's scary a bit. Anyway, let me ask you this about where you are also going in your own direction, given your party's position. I think you're out there with Senator Gillibrand of New York fighting for a, an outside check on uh, sexual abuse of military women. Explain. You know, I think nothing motivates me more than trying to make sure that the law defends the defenseless and defends those who are minorities, not just color of the skin, but could be gender, but also could be a minority because of your ideology, the shade of your ideology. So when I hear about people being violently abused and that they have to report this to their commander, to me, it's kind of like you work for a corporation and you'd have to report being abused to your boss, who may well be a drinking buddy with someone who abused you. Really, it makes more sense to have it outside the chain of command. I don't understand why someone who's been abused would have to report it to someone who may well be a friend of the person who did the abusing. It should be to people who don't know any of the people. The other thing is, is that accusations can go, work both ways. If it's a false accusation, do you want people who are impartial and don't know either side to make a judgment and someone who's uh, trained in family law and trained in disputes like this? Or do you want someone who says, I'm the colonel and I have to make a decision and I have, I don't, I don't know how to make this decision and be impartial. I think most colonels would say, I'd rather not be involved in this. I'd rather let someone in family court deal with this because there are accusations on both sides and it's it's difficult to get through to find justice, but I know it's not fair the way it is. And I meet women. I met a woman last week, and she gave me her picture, and it was her in fatigues and her with her weapon. And she said she loved the military, and she said, "Well, you see Senator Gillibrand," and chokes me up just thinking about it. She says, "When you see Senator Gillibrand, give her this picture to show her that I'm proud of both me and her for leading the effort on this." Senator Rand Paul, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thanks, Chris. The voice of new conservatism. Joining me right now is MSNBC political analyst David Korn of Mother Jones and April Ryan, White House correspondent for American Urban Radio Networks. Just to get a quick reaction, then we'll get the, back to R.I. Garner and the death and the, and the decision over there in Staten Island. What do you make of this guy? 
Well, you know, he's not saying anything new, that he's, he's taking this position. To me, the big question is, as he gets closer to running for president, which cl clearly he wants to do, will he get louder and more vocal on this non-interventionism or the or intervention skepticism yeah. that he's been pushing? Because it, 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 when he does that, he is setting up a bloody civil war yeah. inside the Republican Against the Giuliani crowd. You know, you, know, you know John McCain's head will explode, <laughs> Bill Crystal, <laughs> if he gets close to getting the nomination, you see this week, interestingly enough, Ted Cruz today, or I think maybe tomorrow, he's doing a forum with Bill Crystal. So these people oh, are sort of shaking out. It's bringing coal to Newcastle. The neocon, yeah, right know. wing, and, and the Rand Paul wing. I like it. It's and you like it too. And you like it too. Fun fight. April, let's talk about today's story in the horror up in New York with that. Uh, look at the reaction we're watching it right. It's totally nonviolent as we speak at 8 o'clock Eastern. Uh, you, your view of the whole situation. It's a painful situation for minorities in America that uh, have a reality that many Americans, mainstream Americans, don't have. You know, if you have young men in your family, you pray for them and make sure they come home safe. You, if you're, it could be a man or a woman, you have a run-in with a police officer, you never know what could result. But the bottom line is, the president and Eric Holder, the attorney general, hit the right chord by saying the issue of trust. Now, beyond the trust, what is the end game? Stop the talk, stop the protests, not stop the protests, but beyond the protests and the talk, what is the end game? What is going to result? And what we understand, and I talked to uh, Chris Darden, former LA prosecutor. He said, you know, he said there is a problem with some of the bias between prosecutors and some of these police officers and law. Uh, departments, law enforcement departments around the country. And he said it's important that there are independent investigations from the Justice Is Department. Is he saying that they're in league together? Some of them he's saying, yes, they are. He says he's, he's concerned about the bias. He did say that. Chris okay. Darden. Was he? I don't think so. I, I think... being tough here. No, but I, I, I don't think I so. I like the guy. Anyway, thank you, David Korn and April Ryan. I know the difference. I, mean, I, I know you I do. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a tough day for America again. Yeah, I'm an optimist. It it's a tough day. Anyway, you're watching Hardball, the place for politics.